the tube rules all. I mean, nobody in his right mind could imagine that Ronald Reagan could be elected to the presidency of this country in 1940. Uh, and of course, it's true. You can say, well, it doesn't make any difference. We don't live in 1940, and that is true. But a movie actor without very great intelligence, with an extraordinarily fading bad memory, with an inability to understand even the most primitive political or economic ideas, <laughs> nonetheless came across as a man who could have been elected forever. He could have beaten Bush. He could be re-elected from the grave. With the I, right TV ads. With the right TV ads. On the other hand, Giuliani is, is mounting an Ailes campaign, right. Right, which is a filthy campaign. It's a campaign that resurrects every tiny sin. And gentlemen and ladies don't mention them. But a guy like Ailes exploits them. And Ailes exploited them for Nixon. He's in the business. He makes a tremendous amount of money. He has a whole group of people. And uh, he's a professional in character assassination. America's greatest award-winning documentary producer, Emil D'Antonio, joins us to discuss the media and politics and all of the dirty tricks and who does them and to whom. Right now on Alternative Views. <laughs> Radical filmmaker Emil D'Antonio has been studying the media and politics in American society for several decades now. His first film, Point of Order, was on the McCarthy Army hearings and studied how television processed this historical event and brought down Joe McCarthy, the great tyrant of the 1950s. D'Antonio also made a film, Millhouse, that focuses on Richard Nixon and the media as one of the themes of this movie. Since then, he's been reflecting on the role of the media in the Reagan administration, the Bush administration, and the general political functions that the media have taken over in American society in the last several decades. So, Dee, we're very happy to have you with us on Alternative Views, and we want to talk about politics and the media with you. But before we talk to Emil D'Antonio, here are some news stories from the Alternative Press. One of the most uh, striking cases that has recently come into the news concerning the Reagan administration's traffic with drug dealers concerns American John Hull, who's a 69-year-old rancher in Costa Rica. Hull, from, 19, from October of 1984 to September of 1985, received $10,000 a month from Oliver North for so-called humanitarian aid to the Contras. It was alleged the country that Hall's ranch in Costa Rica and his six landing strips were used as a Contra supply operation that were also the source of a drug operation that was used to supply and refinance Contra operations. We've reported this on uh, alternative views, and this was widely discussed in uh, the alternative uh, uh, press. Senator John Kerry, for instance, in his investigations in Congress into the connection between the Contras and uh, big uh, drug lords came up with five witnesses who said they saw Hall actually involved in the uh, cocaine uh, business. They saw 
cocaine being delivered from Colombia on his ranch. They saw cocaine being loaded on planes back to the U.S. And a couple of the pilots who drove, who flew the cocaine back to the U.S. even testified against um, Hall. Well, this last January the 13th, the Costa Rican government arrested Hall, charged him with uh, drug traf trafficking and violating neutrality laws that prohibited supplying arms to the Contras. So Hull was in jail in Costa Rica and was about to uh, go on trial for his alleged efforts in uh, Contra drug running and uh, gun running. Well, at that time, Lee Hamilton, who was the head of the Iran-Contra Select Committee, wrote a very threatening letter to uh, President Arias of Costa Rica saying that, and I quote, it is our hope that Mr. Hull's case can be concluded promptly and that it be handled in a manner that will not complicate U.S.-Costa Rican relations. We thus want to avoid situations or incidents that could adversely affect our relations at this time. Mm. Pre uh, President Arias responded quickly and strongly to this attempt to try to blackmail him to uh, drop the uh, drug charges against uh, Hall. Arias replied, I deeply regret your letter. Mr. John Hall is accused of serious crimes, including participating in the illegal trafficking of drugs to the United States. It pains me that you insinuate that the exemplary relationships between Costa Rica and the United States could deteriorate because our legal system is fighting against drug trafficking, no matter how powerful the people who might participate in it or what external backing they might have. Well, Hull was held in prison in Costa Rica until March, at which time the Costa Rican government let him out hmm. on humanitarian reasons because of a, a heart uh, condition. On July of this year, just before he was scheduled to go to trial, Hull uh, jumped bail and returned uh, to the United States, showing up in Miami and more recently on his family uh, farm in um, Indiana. Two days after he fled, a drug commission of the Costa Rican government released a report detailing both Hull's support for the Contra's southern front, illegal uh, arms operations there, and allegations that he was one link in what has become known as the Contra cocaine connection. The special Costa Rican commission concluded the amount of and frequency with which drugs moved through Costa Rica were the, factories that motiv were the factors that motivated this commission to study the Contras supply network. The private network that supported the Nicaragua resistance, the Contras, used a number of people, both public and private, in order to achieve its goals. In Costa Rica's case, the network chose Mr. John Hall and several experienced Costa Rican pilots. The facts detailed here show that narco traffickers had infiltrated different levels of the network and operated and offered military support to the Contra. So that's the final report of the Costa Rican government that has a warrant out for uh, Hull, declaring him to be a fugitive from justice and asking him that he be extradited from the United States to Costa Rica. So if the United States was serious about fighting drugs, they would send John Hall back to um, Costa Rica. So far, there's no indication that they will. And this story has been completely blacked out of the media in the United States. I haven't seen anything uh, on it. Uh, Senator Kerry has announced, though, that he wants to uh, bring um, John Hall to Congress to try to do some more investigation about the extent of Contra cocaine uh, connections. Doug, there are some more congressional investigations along with the U.S. Customs Service into an airport in Mena, Arkansas. Now, how many of us have been to Mena, Arkansas, or even know where it is? Well, it seems to be a very important place in the drug business. Uh, Barry Seal, the former Green Beret and reputed CIA man, who boasted of making a, <coughs> a million and a half in personal profits and just one cocaine flight alone, well, he turned up dead, you know, as we told you about before. Well, it seems that he might have been involved in uh, Mena, Arkansas. There's a little airport there that's known as one of the fastest, most economical stopovers in the Western Hemisphere for aircraft rehabilitation, painting, repair, and modification, all services that are highly valued in the drug world. This is an article from Freedom Magazine, by the way. Well, the reason the, the, the local people, the local uh, 
prosecuting attorney and local media people have been nosing around to find out what's been going on out at this uh, place, out at this airport. Uh, but every time they try to come up with some investigations, they're either hushed or squelched. They even had a, uh, a grand jury which was looking into it. But the grand jury just did a whitewash. The people who were called in, they weren't asked the right questions. They hammed and hawed around and they came up well. They couldn't find any information. But of course, they could have if they wanted to. According to Arkansas law enforcement officials that were interviewed by the uh, Freedom Magazine reporters, all of these things that go on, or a lot of these things that go on in this airport are indications of running drugs and guns. For instance, you can, uh, it's, there have been indications that tail numbers have been altered so that the, the plane couldn't, uh, nobody could keep track of it. According to an Arkansas official, he said uh, there was plenty of evidence that illegal money laundering was going on, but no indictments came down from that either, any of these investigations. It gets even murkier in that uh, one uh, Arkansas official stated that uh, he had been questioned by federal investigators who came to MENA to locate some $48 million in unaccounted funds. The investigators uh, uh, reportedly said that the money came from drug deals connected with Richard Secord and Oliver North and their highly acclaimed enterprise. You remember we was talking about that. The investigators were seeking to find the money in one of Mena, Arkansas's uh, banks. Well, the police have been stonewalled, the local police there and their efforts to find out, they've been stonewalled by the Justice Department, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the FBI, the Internal Revenue Service. When the heat is on, the suspects fall back on the line that they worked for Barry Seal. And they say they work for the CIA. And once you say you work for the CIA, well, everybody has to drop it because it's national security. Hmm. Frank, there's several new books on the whole history of the drug trade that were, was published in, uh, in these times that I want to give a, a brief report on to present some historical context for the uh, whole political economy of the uh, drug trade. One interesting document is a yearly State Department report on what, which countries are actually producing the drugs and how much they're producing and where the drugs are going. The State Department for the last several years has been doing this report on the grounds that any country that is actively involved in the drug trade is supposed to not get U.S. aid. However, this is hypocritical according to an analysis of In These Times because last year the only drug producing country that was denied aid by the United States government because of this State Department report was Afghanistan. And according to In These Times, this um, prohibition of aid to a Afghanistan uh, omits the fact that 87% of the drugs that are actually produced in Afghanistan are not produced by anyone that has anything to do with the government of that country, but rather has to do with the rebels that are supported by the United States and the uh, CIA. They quote uh, one rebel leader who says, we must grow and sell opium to fight our holy war against the Russian non-believers. According to this uh, In These Times report, Afghanistan is now, the rebels in Afghanistan are now one of the biggest producers of uh, opium in the entire uh, world and that their production has doubled in the last uh, few years since the Reagan and the Bush administrations were supporting the uh, Afghan rebels there that were fighting to overthrow the uh, communist um, government. I can't remember where I saw it, but uh, a year or so ago, somebody was interviewing a kind of a mid or low level uh, mafia drug type, and they asked him if he was afraid of getting busted for drugs because he was doing he was dealing drugs pretty good making good living out of it and because there were so many others who were being busted at the time he said no i'm not, i'm not uh, worried about that said the drug operations in the world now are controlled mainly by the cia and interpol the international police organization so so long as you cooperate with them you're all right but if you start freelancing if you start being a private enterpriser in the drug business 
and get away from their control and hegemony, well, then that's when you got busted. So he really wasn't, he was going to stay close, snuggle up close to the CIA and Interpol. Well, there's an article in Freedom for May and June edition, which chronicles some of this, talks about it. And the National Commission on Law Enforcement and Social Justice has asked the House of Representatives to look into Interpol's connection with drugs, particularly in their relationships with Noriega. As lo and behold, the Interpol Secretary General, Raymond Kendall, in 1987, gave Manuel Noriega a scroll, thanking him for his role in helping to prevent international drug smuggling and combating drug trafficking. Wasn't that nice of them? So, but it goes even further than this. It's much more sinister. There's uh, Lieutenant Colonel Nivaldo Madrinan in Panama, who in he's been the Interpol executive, top man down there since 1983. People in Panama say that he was responsible for the murder of a well-known civic leader, Serafin Mitroti, in 1983, just after Senor Mitroti had come out strongly against drugs and had begun a major anti-drug campaign. Mrs. Matroti even said that this Madrinan, the Interpol guy, wound up wearing the $20,000 ring that her husband, her deceased husband, had. So he must have been involved very closely with the killing. There are other sources, too, down there indicating how closely uh, uh, this Madrinan, the Interpol guy, has been with um, the Panamanian Defense Forces, Noriega, and drug running. The uh, organization, the uh, so, uh, National Commission for Law Enforcement and Social Justice, went further and started talking about the origins of Interpol. Uh, we've talked about this a few times before in alternative views about the Nazi the starting up of Interpol using ex-Nazis. Well, they indicated the same thing. Their investigation showed that Interpol's president from 1968 to 1972 was Paul Dieckhoff. He was a former Nazi SS officer. They quoted uh, in this story an Australian member of parliament who said that the list of presidents and executive members of the board of Interpol read like a Nazi's who's who during as well as after the war. But if the place, he said, what do you expect? If you place a Nazi in charge of a fascist organization like Interpol, the result is a crossbreed that can really do horrible things. And a West German police union spokesperson said that through Interpol, the drug lords in South America and Southeast Asia have access to information in Interpol's files, so they know what's going on all the time. So this is the reason why the NCLE is trying to get an investigation by Congress to do this. We'll have more news after we speak with our special guest, Emil D'Antonio, America's foremost producer of documentaries, such as Rush to Judgment, Millhouse, a white comedy, You're the Pig, Point of Order, and Mr. Hoover and I. We'll be discussing mainly the mass media and their relation with politics, and particularly the dirty tricks. Dee, let's begin by talking about the role of television in politics. In your movie on Richard Nixon, Millhouse, you had some interviews with Joe McGinnis, who wrote a book on the selling of the president that was a bestseller in, I think, 1969 that studied the role of the media in the 1968 election. What did you learn from this, these interviews with McGintis and your study of uh, Nixon and the media? Well, I think the first thing that uh, I learned personally was that Nixon studied media and practiced and rehearsed television in a way that no other major candidate had done before. We thought that Jack Kennedy had done that, but Jack Kennedy knew he was good on TV. He was what Marshall McLuhan called cool, unruffled, uh, fair, whereas Nixon always uh, exhibited uh, sometimes anger. And uh, I mean, if you take the Checker speech, which is really long before television, 
uh, made in uh, 1952, you see that he pulls out all the stops like an old-fashioned movie, including tears and uh, rage. Uh, he learned to get rid of all of that. And this is one of the reasons I put much of the checker speech into my film Millhouse, so that the viewer could see Nixon at one age and Nixon then, none of it came naturally to him, so that he had to study very hard how to use television. He was never any good at it. He, I mean, in, in, as, just as in sports, no one is ever as good as a natural. So as with TV or in politics, no one is ever as good as a natural. Nixon studied hard, but the study always showed. The lamp of study was always clearly there. And uh, he's also always so contrived. And very <laughs> contrived, yeah. And uh, he was never any good uh, at a really open press conference. Uh, Reagan, well, that's another story. But uh, Nixon used television, however, very intelligently by creating theater and faking it. Uh, we were talking earlier about an event that I find almost uh, the most revealing the single show he did, because he traveled it all over the country, in the 68 election. He would get six moderately well-known people in any given, uh, the one I filmed was in Philadelphia. It included a doctor, a lawyer, a woman of some kind, to show that maybe two women of some kind, that's right, there were two women, four men, and there would be a Catholic, a Jew, a Protestant, and uh, you were supposed to recognize this by their faces, of course, which shows that you're totally without any bigotry. <laughs> but uh, all these people were prepared, and they were all Republicans, and they were all pro-Nixon. So Nixon, first he had uh, Bud Wilkinson, the yeah. coach of the Oklahoma football team, say, now we're going to introduce tonight the presidential candidate, Richard Milhouse Nixon, and this is a totally unrehearsed program. These people are going to ask any question they want. And so the people would then say, Mr. Nixon, what is your view on Vietnam? There's a totally unrehearsed question. <laughs> and so Nixon came in with this prepared answer, and he was terrific, and uh, terrific for Nixon anyway, given his limitations. And this happened. But the, the one I have, a really wise guy, a wonderful man, um, who was a friend of Joe McGinnis's, who wrote the book, The Selling of the President, about Nixon, they somehow they planted this wild Irishman in there <laughs> who was no. totally unprepared. I mean, he was totally, he hadn't been exposed to any of this. He, and he looked at Nixon, he looked him right in the eye and said, Mr. Nixon, what is your opinion of this? And the subject he named was something Nixon wasn't prepared for. And it, uh, Nixon absolutely lost his cool and uh, made up some kind of crazy answer. And it was very, very revealing. Um, Nixon tended to blow anything that was extemporaneous, in, in which he spoke off the cuff, as we're, in a sense, are speaking. I mean, he, uh, he once said to a question, um, well, uh, if I retire from the White House, I'd like to go to some place like Oxford and write two or three books a year. I mean, any man who wrote a book knows you can't write two or three books a year unless you're writing trashy, sexy novels or something. But he was talking about serious political stuff. Uh, he, he tended always to blow it unless he was very well prepared. Uh, and the film attempts to reveal the nature of the preparation, how much there was. It shows how to be elected president. It's the first film ever done about a president in office and also about how that president got there. And uh, the tube rules all. I mean, nobody in his right mind could imagine that Ronald Reagan could be elected to the presidency of this country in 1940. Uh, and, of course, it's true. You can say, well, it doesn't make any difference. We don't live in 1940, and that is true. But a movie actor without very great intelligence, with an extraordinarily fading bad memory, with an inability to understand even the most primitive political or economic ideas, <laughs> nonetheless came across as a man who could have been elected forever. He could have beaten Bush. He could be re-elected from the grave. With the I, right TV ads. With the right TV ads, it, it taken when it made when he was alive. Right. But he could have, he was remarkable. I mean, it's the most devastating commentary against this country that I know. 
is that a man who was so totally unfit to be president was elected president, and overwhelmingly so. Isn't this also the flip side of this is the opposition. The opposition was so inept in not pointing out any of his deficiencies. Can you imagine what, uh, say, if Harry Truman would have run against uh, Nixon, I mean uh, uh, Reagan? Uh, you know, I <laughs> want to get back to the up, CIA right? because we all know this, but it's a very important little item. Uh, Jimmy Carter was convinced he would destroy Reagan because he had his famous briefing book. Mm -hmm. And in that book, he had the list of every possible issue that could be discussed in a debate. And, and Carter had a good memory. And he had all the points that should be made. And then someone stole the briefing book and gave it to Reagan. <laughs> Carter went bananas, of course, because this was only a few days before their debate. The briefing book is gone. Now, we know who stole it. They were rogue, maybe rogue, or maybe even active members of the CIA. But who were under the direction of... Under the uh, direction... Uh, the man who became the head George of the CIA. Yes, and, and George Bush. Uh, William Casey. And William George. Casey. Well, who William was, Casey and, and, and George Bush. Bush. Right. Uh, right. Matter of fact, that was part of that October surprise that's operation part of it, yeah. in which they had a covert action against uh, a sitting American president, and they had something like, what, two, 127, 137 operatives uh, working inside the Carter administration to bring it down and to provide information to them. There were a Incredible. tremendous number, that's right. Uh, so um, it began with the briefing book and then it went into the October surprise. And between the two, as uh, everybody knows, uh, the, the single critical issue of that campaign was the hostages in Iran. And uh, the story of the October surprise is that Casey, and some people say Bush, I don't believe that, but that Casey and others went to Paris and met with the Iranians and made a deal. For some reason, Omani hated Carter. So a deal was made that the hostages would not be released, and therefore Reagan could campaign on that issue of the disgrace of America having hostages in Iran, and that the hostages would be released immediately after the election or inauguration of, President, of Reagan. In return for arms. In return for armaments, mm -hmm. exactly. There we were. The country we hated most in all the world officially, Iran, who had held our hostages so cruelly for so long. And there was the great American patriot Ronald Reagan, President Reagan then, who of course, of course with the CIA, sent arms to Iran and the hostages were returned to us and Reagan looked like a hero. Right after the inauguration. The right after the inauguration. Really. And shortly thereafter, a uh, <laughs> Israeli plane flying over Turkey loaded with American arms en route to Iran to crashed, crashed, indicating that something was um, up at that time. And the major media didn't pick up on this, basically, no, either. No, no. Uh, D, there's a mediating link between Nixon, Reagan, and Bush and this whole issue of politics and media, and that link is named Roger Ailes. In 1968, Na Ailes was the media manager for the uh, Nixon uh, campaign and was in charge in managing his campaign and his, his image. In the McGinty's book, there's a revealing quote from Ailes. Ailes says, this is it. Elections are never going to be the same hereafter. Henceforth, only performers will be able to be politicians. In other words, you oh, need wow. actors to act out the role. Ailes was also, from the beginning, uh, par excellence, the dirty, pl the dirty right. pool player. Right. And this is happening in the New York City election right now, where at the beginning, David Dinkins, the black candidate, was far in advance of uh, uh, Giuliani, the Republican candidate. Now, the Democrats have always been a little soft. I mean, one of Giuliani's weaknesses, which I would have exploited had I been a Democrat, is that he wears a huge toupee. Now, there's nothing wrong with being bald. As all three of us can attest. But there is something just a little peculiar. <laughs> really? About the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, headpiece he wore, mm -hmm. wears. And nobody mentions it. I mean, people who know something about New York a little more than the average newspaper reader don't say anything. They know it. Mm. 
Uh, who is uh, Giuliani? What, what is at stake in this New York uh, mayor's campaign? He's a guy with a great presidential hunger. Oh. He would like to be the first Italian-American elected to the presidency. He, ha he does have a very good record as a United States attorney. And that's a flashy thing. Uh, you know, he, he did the mafia, he did a lot of other people, and he, he won most of his cases. If he were to become mayor of New York, which most people consider an ungovernable city, yes. <laughs> and if he were to make it work in any way, if he could just reduce crime somewhat, or drugs somewhat, which I don't think he could do, but if he could, he would surely be a presidential candidate. Because nobody anywhere is doing anything about drugs, and nobody really is doing anything about crime. It keeps increasing because the nature of our society is so unjust. It's not something you can increase. If you have poor people living in a ghetto and they turn on the tube and they see ads for Mercedes and Cadillac and they see all these shows that are full of uh, people who seem to have limitless money, it's not uh, hard to figure out that they're going to be, you know, that there's a way to make a lot of money. There are 18-year-old guys in New York who make $4,000 a week selling crack and that puts you into an area where the police aren't going to bother you anymore because you can pay them. Yeah. The alternative is either no job at all or a dead-end nothing job at the minimum or wage. Or drugs. Who is Dinkins by contrast? What, is, what tradition does he represent? Dinkins' tradition is the uh, New York machine, political machine, which is part of what makes him vulnerable. Mm. He was uh, chair of the city council. Uh, he's uh, He's a good politician. He's not a great speaker. He's a quiet man. He's a, a man who I think inspires confidence because he doesn't raise any ugly issues. He's, he's a very gentle, quiet person. I mean, that's his public posture. And uh, it was very effective because people were tired of all that other stuff. And then Giuliani, Giuliani was hopeless. Giuliani is, is mounting an Ailes campaign, right. which is a filthy campaign. It's a campaign that resurrects every tiny sin. I mean, the one thing about politics of any kind in democratic countries is that everybody has committed tiny sins. Uh, the reason I could never run for politics is I'm a drunk, I've been married six times, you know, I've had a lot of problems. <laughs> but ordinary people, uh, uh, maybe one night they got drunk and drove, uh, one night they had an affair with something. But everybody has these peccadillos, and gentlemen and ladies don't mention them. But a guy like Ailes exploits them. And Ailes exploited them for Nixon. He's in the business. He makes a tremendous amount of money. He has a whole group of people. And uh, he's a professional in character assassination. He brought the Willie Horton ads to us in the uh, Dukakis Bush uh, 1988 election, which were grotesquely racist. And this is a very uh, relevant factor to this Dinkins campaign, since obviously Dinkins is a black politician running for mayor of New York, and the, the only way that Giuliani can win is to get all the whites to vote for him. So obviously racism is, going, is a subtle subtext, or not so subtle, of this campaign. And having Ailes in there to exploit racism to the maximum is, is a very um, frightening and uh, appalling phenomenon. And the New York Times and ABC, NBC, CBS do not cover this. So Ailes it looks like just another guy doing a job. But you know, there's something. Uh, Nixon, from the very start, got his political ascendancy uh, from destroying people's Absolutely. reputations as a, as a red baiter. So what did Ailes contribute to Nixon TV that he had? Was the TV slickness? TV, TV, uh, TV slick. That's the, I, I would like to go back to your point, though, Frank, point. because I think it's very good, because people forget that Nixon was the McCarthyite before McCarthy. Right. Because in 1946, when he ran for the Congress, some bankers in California interviewed six young men to run for Congress. These were money people, power people. And they chose Nixon, A, because he appeared in his Navy uniform, <laughs> and B, because he already had a law degree. So Nixon was chosen. He, he was running against an extraordinary man, actually, who had been elected six times, who was a liberal. Jerry Voorhees. Jerry Voorhees, who had a private fortune, who was your characteristic New Deal Democrat, privately rich, 
concern for the poor, concern for the blacks, etc. And Nixon was your, he was the quintessential liberal, and Nixon is your quintessential opportunist. So he began a campaign that was unlike any campaign that anybody has any record of. People would, in the middle of the night, phone you, say, do you know who Jerry Voorhees really is? And hang up. They didn't say he was a communist. Was, do you know who he really is? Bingo. Voorhees, elected six times, a man with his own money, plenty to run. He was wiped out. Nixon won a huge victory. But and there Nixon, was a lot of red baiting, though, in addition to that. Well, that, that, well, that's what I call red baiting. I mean, you know, what he was implying was that Voorhees was a communist. And then he red baited him specifically mm. because of his views on labor, mm. etc. But he wasn't a radical. He was, he was a rich American yeah. of progressive views. And he ended up being tagged as a communist, of course. Nixon completed that little job in 1950 with Helen Gahagan Douglas when he started calling her the Pink Lady, which was, as you know, a fairly well-known drink in those days. But he also accused her of being soft in the Korean War. Uh, he wiped her out. She was a beautiful woman in every sense. She was a great political figure as well as a movie star and an extraordinarily attractive and uh, articulate woman. But there was no way you could go against Murray Chotner, who worked for Nixon and Nixon, because they, there was nothing in the gutter that was too low for Nixon. Nixon, on the other hand, is an extraordinary man because he never gives up. Here he is getting, pushing up two years, he'll be 80. And he's still writing books proving that he was a great president. I mean, he doesn't write the books, of course. He <laughs> hires people to write the books, but they, hire the, they write the books under his direction, proving that he was a great president. And this, you know, you ha this is the one thing I admire about Nixon. The only thing I admire about him is he has a kind of stick to it in this a kind of lonely man's guts that uh, I, I find re uh, admirable, frankly. I despise him as a politician, as a man, but except for that. So Roger Ailes is really continuing the Nixon, Murray, Chotner techniques of dirty pool, of dirty campaigning, but he's using television ads as his weapon, as the main way of slinging mud on to the opponent. He's worked in every campaign since he worked for Nixon in 68. He's become very rich out of uh, slinging mud. Well, what are some of the techniques of his political ads? How does he manipulate and sling mud here? It's not as much ads mm. as leaking information. Mm. I mean, he has researchers. They go through every day of a man's life that they can find. And in the case of Dinkins, when you come out of an underprivileged environment when it's harder to be elected to anything including the lower offices that Dinkins had there are obviously mistakes you've made along the way as indeed Giuliani made or I would make or you would make or uh, George Bush would make but Ailes simply goes down develops them completely and then gives them out in pre to press releases so that some one journalist really goes all out with it, which gives the guy a lot of passion. Then the other papers pick it up, or the networks, whichever way he's going. And then ads are designed by Ailes people that then fit into that whole thing. I saying, see, so it's part of a whole strategy. It's a structure. Right, it's a whole, a structure if it right, were just okay. uh, releasing dirt, it wouldn't be enough. Mm -hmm. It's a whole gestalt okay. that, it, that involves the dirt, how to exploit the dirt, and how to remove your character, your own candidate, from such a grubby, dreary, uh, you know, your character is Rudy Giuliani, the United States attorney who sent those people to jail, whereas this guy, Dinkins, etc. And Dinkins was so far ahead, and now he's falling in the polls. So, Ailes works, and the only way Dinkins will win is if he attacks Ailes mm. and says, Ailes, who is this wretched creature, is Giuliani's man, finally. Mm. He's got to do something fairly remarkable. I mean, there is a, a connection here, linkage, between Ailes and the most despicable right-wing politicians of our generation, because it was Ailes who won, helped uh, Nixon win in his 
uh, bids for the presidency. That was Reagan's media man, and that helped Bush beat uh, Dukakis, and is now helping not only um, Dinkins, uh, rather Giuliani in New York, but this guy Coulter in uh, New Jersey. Oh, so every time there's a controversial or a close uh, election between a liberal Democrat and a right-wing Republican, Ailes is brought in to be the hitman. He's sort of the hired gun, the gunslinger. Quarter is who's the worst. Quarter, yeah. Yeah. Who's he? He's an extreme right-winger, and Bush has gone in there to speak for him. He's so far behind Florio. This is for, and this is more important than a... It's New Jersey. This is for the governor, oh, the governorship governor. of New Jersey. And uh, Florio was always many, many points ahead. And now they're in with the smears on Florio. You know, if you have an Italian name, you obviously have mafia connections and all the rest of it. So um, Florio is actually a, a very decent candidate. Uh, I'm not um, a great admirer of most of the times of either party, but he's a fairly decent candidate. He was far ahead because people really liked him. And uh, Quarter is a inept person, unfortunately, in public presence. He may be intelligent, I don't know. But his public presence is too angry and uh, hostile. And uh, But the fact that Bush came in and spoke for him and that now Ailes is doing his campaign changed everything. We don't know how that one's going to come out. Why do you suppose did the Democrats during this uh, last presidential election, if anybody was vulnerable, it was George Bush. You know, they had the October surprise information, George Bush they had his girlfriends. involved with yeah, yeah, his girlfriends, his extramarital affairs. They had uh, George Bush and all the drug operations that he was involved in. And the, not even to mention that uh, you know, he doesn't seem to appear overly bright. But they would not attack him. And he seemed to be just absolutely impossibly in, invulnerable. In point of order there, he's not at all unintelligent. He's just not a good public speaker. He doesn't express himself well, but he's not at all stupid. Really, he is not. And uh, it's not because he did well at Yale and at Andover either. I mean, it's not any Ivy League prejudice I share because I went to Harvard, but it's, uh, it's simply that I don't think Bush is at all stupid. I, don't, I, don't, I think he's a very bad speaker and he loses. Uh, he's a, he, audiences disturb him. He has to have a prepared mm. speech. He seems so shallow, but, or is that part of the well, I think, mis misconception? Well, I, I think you have to be shallow to be elected. I don't see anybody, <laughs> I, don't see, I mean, uh, on either party, I don't see anybody yeah. profound being elected. Well, I think if you're an intellectual, you have no chance of being elected dog catcher, frankly. Stevenson proved that. And Stephen wasn't so intellectual. Yeah. He was just intellectual compared to the others. Right. But, I mean, the question Frank posed, yeah. which is a very good one, which is why didn't the Democrats employ similar techniques where they wouldn't even have to lie or sling yeah, mud? The they truth. could just speak up about the record. Well, in the case of Dukakis, I think there was something weird in that campaign to begin with. I mean, you and I discussed that this morning, and I, I think we agree that uh, Dukakis knew what to do, and he didn't do it. And why did he not do it? I mean, you know, there was something funny about that campaign. I had the feeling as it was going on and after the election, you could smell that he wasn't going to win, that it wasn't in the cards for him to win. And you hate to say that anybody took a dive, Republican or Democrat or any party, but you had the feeling that he was either protecting his wife or himself or his, one of his of a child or something, that something was amiss somewhere, that he was blackmailable or because he was so far ahead, and in the first debate, he was so much better. In the second debate, he didn't seem to be, he was flaccid. He was so soft. He didn't seem uh, like a man who could be elected, not just governor of Massachusetts, be elected anything. And, uh, and it went downhill. Uh, and he went down. Why was that? I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's in the, in the, in the general realm of magic mystery. <laughs> I mean, on the other hand, there is another factor here, and that is during the entire 1980s, the Democratic opposition in Congress rolled over and played dead to Reagan and Reaganism on every single issue. Reagan got his tax cut, his economic program. He got everything through Congress that he wanted. Contra aid. The, contra aid. The Democrat, I think there's a bankruptcy of, of uh, okay, democratic uh, liberalism here in this country. They just don't have programs and convictions and courage to stand up to these right-wing thugs 
and to call a spade a spade. Whereas the Republicans have plenty of uh, guts to go out, you know, get in the gutter and fight like hell to win and put through and their programs. And, and basically make it clear that the country belongs to the rich. And that they have a and program, those, they have an agenda, and by God, they're going to get it through. You get in your our way and you're destroyed, as Jim Wright and Tony Coelho and other okay. Democrats found out. But that uh, almost confirms yeah. what I was saying okay. about uh, Dukakis in a way. Mm -hmm. Because something happened to Dukakis along the way. Mm -hmm. He began with such a tremendous lead in the polls. And I don't mean just after the convention, but even for a while after. Right. And suddenly, he was almost a non-candidate. And mm -hmm. why? I mean, something else did happen. Mm -hmm. uh, all the issues that you've talked about are absolutely correct, but they could have been brought up with anybody that the Democrats nominated or could have been brought up right after the convention as well as at any time, as well as consistently through the whole campaign. Mm -hmm. But bingo, uh, Dukakis led in the polls and then he mysteriously stopped leading. Here's, here's where Roger Ailes comes in again, because at the very time Dukakis was doing nothing, Bush and Roger Ailes were running the most aggressive anti-Dukakis campaign in history. And at this point, uh, Bush started slowly going up precisely at the time that uh, Ailes was putting out his Willie Horton ads convicting Dukakis of being soft on crime, the Boston Harbor ads showing sludge and filth in Bar <laughs> Boston Harbor claiming Dukakis was soft on environmentalism, which was, you know, a blatant lie, I mean, Absolutely. compared to uh, Boston Bush Harbor and had Reagan. sewage put in it from 1778. Right. Um, so anyway, uh, every day uh, the Republicans and Roger Ailes would get out there and punch the shit out of Dukakis. And Dukakis uh, just did nothing. But are you telling us then, in fact, that the only way you can win a major race is to play dirty pool? Well, you have to fight hard to win an election, and that means, one, you have to have convictions and something to run on, and two, you have to have the will to mount a campaign and use TV ads that might involve um, hardball if your opponent is using it against you. As you know, right. uh, in your house today, I called right. up a black friend of mine right. who was in politics in New York right. and said, look, this is what you've got to do, right. and then you, gave, you spoke, and I called her back again right. and and I think we both gave her some very good ideas frankly and, uh, and we'll share them uh, with you um, what we said was that the only way that uh, Dinkins is going to be able to win in New York is to go on the offensive if he lets Giuliani smear him and refuses to really fight hard to win he's not going to we also came to the conclusion that Roger Ailes should be an issue in this New York mayoral campaign because Ailes has become the major force in American political life, the Darth Vader of American politics with his dirty uh, mudslinging uh, campaigns has polluted and fouled American politics. And all the reporters know this. Anyone who's a political insider knows that Ailes is the worst um, of the media manipulation people that have ever um, lived. There was even an article on him in, on page 20 of the New York Times yesterday, uh, Thursday, that indicated he was indeed running um, Giuliani's campaign and Coulter's campaign and told of some of his um, um, strategies. So we were suggesting to Flo Kennedy, who works uh, with the Dinkins campaign in New York, that Ailes should be made a issue, that ads should go on that sort of merge Giuliani and um, Ailes image. And Nixon. And Nixon and Reagan and um, uh, Bush. That because they, New York City and New yeah. York State, New York State was the only state, uh, one of the few states not carried by Reagan. Right. New York City was overwhelmingly against Reagan both times. And it's damned hard for a Republican to win in New York unless he has an issue like this. Right. And Ailes has given him that issue. Um, so, yeah, if you attack Ailes, you attack the very heart of the Giuliani campaign that Dinkins is running not against Giuliani, but against Ailes. And Dinkins is a very yeah. quiet gentleman. He's, yeah. he's a gentleman and he's a very quiet man, mm. whereas Giuliani is now stepping it up yeah. uh, into high gear rhetoric. Isn't there another problem which politicians face, particularly against uh, the Republicans nowadays, and that is that during campaigns or debates, or there will be just a whole spate of lies, one right after another. and 
So then the opposition is faced with the fact, well, do I counter all of these lies? Because if I counter all these lies, my time is taken up and I don't be able, and I'm not able to present my own agenda. Plus the fact that if I counter these lies, they're going down the road spewing more lies. So you got to take absolute the lies. So what do they? Yeah. So what do they I do think to you counter? I simply that? say, my, I'd like you to know that my opponent is a liar. Now, I will detail this in future, in future ads of mine. I will supply the facts in newspaper ads in which they will be written carefully so you can read them and go from there. And I think it's time to say that Giuliani is a liar and that the lies... Giuliani is a puppet liar who speaks the lies of his master, Roger Ailes. Giuliani was hopeless. He didn't bring Ailes in until, as you said, he was so far behind right. that he had to do something dra radical and drastic. So he brought in Ailes, and then they started on the personal thing. Anybody is liable to a personal attack. If you're, say, the average age of a candidate, even for mayor of New York today, is probably around 50. Uh, Dinkins being somewhat older, and Giuliani a little bit less. If you take somebody roughly 50 years old, I mean, what can't you find out about him, you know? Did he cheat in high school? Did he have a love affair in college that was a little steamy or messy? Did he get drunk one night and get stopped by the police? I mean, you know, everybody has one or two of those in his life. Mm. Well, a guy like Ailes can sniff them out. Mm. But on the other hand, we have the situation with Dan Quayle, who was just all full of this type of stuff, and it didn't seem to hurt Bush. Nobody pushed it hard. No one pushed it hard. If the New York Times had gone after, if the New York Times and the Washington Post had gone after Quayle, it would affect, it would, well, I don't know if it would have affected the race anyway, but... It would have had a, 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 a much bigger meaning than it did. Nobody, this, nobody really went after Quayle. This comes back to where we started, which is that of the media. They're the ones that can make or break any given politician. In the case of the Bush-Dukakis race in 1988, the media could have exposed Bush as easily as Dukakis. They could have undone him as they undid Gary Hart and Jim Wright and other liberal Democrats who came under their uh, fire. The same thing in the... Uh, campaign going on now with Giuliani and Dinkins. But who owns the newspapers? The, the right. media are the ones that are defining the issues, are taking the uh, positions. Today, the big story in the New York Times was this uh, financial disclosure on Dinkins. If the Times had not put this on the uh, front page, it would not have been an issue. So they really define reality in a very important uh, sense. What was that story? The, just the story about Dinkins having a financial impropriety where he didn't uh, put the full amount of some investment on an income tax uh, statement. Oh. Just, you know, a little uh, petty financial um, thing. But again, this is the sort of thing that Ailes likes to blow up. But the point is, Ailes couldn't get away with this unless the media went along with it. So really, we have the complicity of the mainstream media with this right-wing Republican. So you can't just blame it on, you know, sleazo politicians like Nixon and sleazo media people like Ailes. If the media didn't play ball with them, uh, the media could expose them, in fact. Well, the media should expose them. Yeah. But Dinkins can expose yeah. them if he has the guts. Mm -hmm. If he takes a full-page ad in the Times and he mm -hmm. has the money to do it, he has a well-financed campaign, mm -hmm. If he takes a half-page ad in the three major New York newspapers and sticks one on TV about Ailes, Ailes and Giuliani, he's got a new ball game going. Mm. But it takes a kind of fighting spirit to do that that I'm not entirely sure Dinkins has. Mm. Well, what about his campaign manager, then? Well, this is what we tried to do today. We called uh, a woman lawyer, a friend of mine, who is very much into the Dinkins campaign and we're hoping that she'll push. See, the, again, the media could push this if they made Ailes an issue. And it's interesting, they definitely made television advertising and even Ailes an issue in the 1988 presidential uh, campaign. Mm -hmm. But the spin on it wasn't fatal to Ailes. They didn't present him in the most strongest negative terms. If anything, they promoted him as a genius perhaps a slightly dark genius of political ads, of political machinations, which just gives him more money in his next uh, campaign. So it all depends on the spin the media puts on a phenomenon like Yale's, whether they define him as a villain or just a hardball professional. Well, you can say the same thing about uh, any administration. Ailes only pops up during campaigns, but during the rest of the time, 
you know, the uh, media certainly didn't attack Reagan or right. expose no. his foolishness. And you're right about Ailes, because it is like a cowboy movie. He's the hired gun who goes from mm -hmm. place to place, and he does what, he, what you want. He prefers Republicans. He prefers extreme conservatives. But he's for hire, and his price is high as hell. We'd like to thank Mr. D'Antonio for being with us on Alternative Views this time. Now for one last news story. In Harper's Magazine, I had a little... Uh, uh, little section with a correction which U.S. News and Rural Report had for a story in which they didn't quite get the everything just right. The story was about uh, Vietnam's sad legacy, the Vietnam veterans who were having trouble adjusting and they were having to live out in the wild. Well, there was a Mr. Sizemore who didn't like the way U.S. News and Rural Report uh, portrayed him, and U.S. News admitted. Well, they said, contrary to the article, Mr. Sizemore did not flee to Alaska, is not hiding out in Alaska, and is capable of living with his fellow human beings, and did not go to Alaska because his biggest fear there was somebody was going to hurt someone. He was afraid he was going to hurt someone. Then they had a picture of Mr. Sizemore in the story, showing, showing him standing in front of a neighbor's rustic cabin. They said, well, that's where he lives. But a matter of fact, he lives in a much more spacious dwelling. And they also, the U.S. News and World Report article, emphasized the primitive nature of where he lived, ignoring the fact that he has several amenities, including electricity and a microwave oven. And uh, they said the story also mentions an incident which uh, Mr. Sizemore complained about the personnel in the Veterans Administration, saying that it occurred in the 80s, but it really didn't. It actually occurred in the 60s. And then finally, contrary to the implications in the article, Mr. Sizemore did not serve in Vietnam and doesn't suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. And the headline or the title of this article, which Harper gives this, is, well, at least we spelled your name right. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Isn't that incredible journalism? But you know, what the hell? You take a speech by George Bush or, or Ronald Reagan, and there are a lot more lies and distortions and many of those, but they never get corrected. And that brings us to the end of this Alternative Views. We'd like to thank our camera person, Eric Eubank, our audio man, Kevin L. West, and our editor, Rob Whittison. And as always, we want to thank Austin Community Television, ACTV. Alternative Views is a presentation of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You might be interested to know that we have expanded the distribution of our program quite a bit in the recent weeks, and now Alternative Views is seen in about 60 cable systems around the country serving approximately 280 cities and suburbs, and about 4.5 to 5 million households. Well, we thank you for watching Alternative Views. Make it a habit, please. Bye-bye.